Right, good morning everybody. Um, <coughs> thanks very much for inviting me here. Um, I enjoyed having a wander around the town centre last night and visiting some of the hostelries um, and I've enjoyed visiting the university this morning. Um, obviously there have been some difficult decisions that JISC has made over the last couple of years. So I, I think my first reaction when I was invited to give this talk was that I was uh, I was quite surprised and I, I hope that uh, I wouldn't find everybody queuing up to throw a load of custard pies at me or maybe some stocks <laughs> or, a, uh, or even a gallows at the, uh, at, at the speaker's podium. So I'm very grateful to, um, to come along um, and speak to you about some of the things that JISC's doing and some of the roles that I think CITIS and, and other organisations uh, continue to should be able to continue to play and it would be very important from JISC's perspective that they do continue to play. Um, just to say a little bit more about um, myself, after doing my, my degrees, um, my first jobs were around learning technology, so I spent a year in Cardiff University working for, um, as a courseware developer for the TLTP STOMP project, Software Teaching of Modular Physics, um, because that was my... That was my area. Um, I, to be honest, I found it a lot more interesting and worthwhile than um, some of the nuclear physics that I was <laughs> researching uh, in the previous three or four years. Although I, I learned a lot of other things during that time as well that stay with me um, a lot more than the, the, the nuclear physics. And, and obviously, CERN was a very interesting place to uh, to be as well during that period. Um, I then moved on to Hull University for two years where I was Education Technology Advisor. Now I've always been at the quite pragmatic end of the learning technology spectrum, so I must admit I tended to avoid standards. I think they're important, but for me, it, I, I saw my own personal strengths being in the more pragmatic area. So uh, at Hull I was working with academics, they tended to be the younger academics, but not universally, to embed uh, computer-assisted learning, CAL as it was called at, the, at that stage, uh, in, in, into curricula and to try and make that integration a bit more seamless, a bit less of a bolt-on. And then did that for a couple of years and then moved to King's College London as senior computer-assisted learning uh, coordinator, which I think would probably be called head of e-learning now. And that was a more strategic role. So as well as uh, leading a small team, working with academics, managing a strategic fund, we actually got consensus for what I think was the first formal computer-assisted learning strategy that became part of the university's main teaching and learning strategy. And probably in one of the organisations you wouldn't have necessarily thought would have been first to do that. And then I became a managerialist, and I guess I must have just decided, so you know, I come back into the room and I, I see a lot of faces that I remember from that period in the 1990s up until about 1998, and I guess I probably disappeared off your radar at that, at that point and started wearing suits and ties and, 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 and things. So, um, Aberyst with Plymouth, uh, and most recently at, at Loughborough University. Um, where I hope I managed to do a few innovative things uh, in the IT services department there, and I certainly very, very ably assisted by colleagues such as Martin Hamilton, who, who has uh, followed me across to JISC um, uh, uh, recently, um, leading to this role as Chief Innovation Officer at JISC. I've been there about nine months now, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm finding my feet. Um, it's still relatively new, um, but I hope um, that the work we're trying to do is taking some shape. I'm going to try and explain that to you. So here's an outline of what I'm going to go through. Uh, first of all, why does JIST need to innovate? Why does any technology organisation need to innovate? <laughs> then I'm going to give some background to JIST. Some people will have heard this already, um, although possibly not from uh, um, the, the perspective that I will uh, give it, and, and others won't. So apologies in advance for people who are, who are more familiar with this. And then what we're doing in, in terms of innovation in JISC now in a new division called Digital Futures, um, how we're trying to construct a pipeline and a, our variation of a co-design process to try and get around not invented here and to try and involve people and build consensus for our innovation work. Um, I'm going to try and explain all that. Now I'm going to move on to some thoughts around standards and particularly standards in relation to innovation. Um, and I must admit, I hope some of these ideas will be, some people in the room will find them provocative because I'm quite keen that we have a discussion. I'm very keen to um, hear your views, actually, on some of the things just should be doing in relation to standards and more widely in, in our 
um, innovation programme. So I hope by saying a few slightly provocative things at the end, I'll stimulate some kind of discussion around the room. Um, that will remain to be seen. Okay. So why does GIST need to innovate? Or, for that matter, why does any technology organisation need to innovate? Now, this is part of the physics department in Oxford University, um, the Townsend building. And that window there was where my research group used to live until a few years ago. Um, but what's interesting about this building in terms of the history of, of, of physics departments it was the first physics laboratory when it was opened in about 90, the early 1910s that had its own dedicated built-in electricity supply throughout the building. Um, next door to the left, the, the Clarendon Laboratory, uh, which was built a few years earlier, didn't have that, nor did any of the other physics departments um, in the UK or in the world, as far as I know. So that was the electrical laboratory. Um, for obvious reasons, and the head of the laboratory was uh, Professor Townsend, and next door was the Clarendon Laboratory, headed by Professor Lindemann. Um, so at that stage, the ability to have electricity on tap really was quite a fundamental tool to enable and quickly enable research. So next door, if you were trying to do some electrical research in, in, in the Clarendon Laboratory, you had to muck around with batteries or get all sorts of rig around, all sorts of other stuff. If you were in the electrical laboratory, you had it all on tap. And so not surprisingly, Professor Lindemann asked Professor Tanzi, well, can we, can we share some of this electricity? Um, we make use of it in our lab as well. And Professor Tanzi said, no, absolutely not. This is you know, my laboratory. This is my competitive advantage for my department and my research. And of course, researchers are very world-class researchers, are competitive animals. There's no doubt about that at all. And it's a very competitive game. Uh, and, and a very competitive sphere. Now, roll the clock on a hundred years. Do you think any, do you know any professors, any world-class eminent professors who worry about where the electricity comes from in their uh, laboratories? I don't. Um, because <laughs> sometime, sometime in the last, sometime in the last 110 years, electricity has become a utility, become a commodity. So I don't know exactly when it happened. It was sometime around the, the, after the war, um, maybe in the 1930s in some places through to the, through the 1950s. So if you track it through from 1910, uh, electricity was a key research technology. Uh, top of the agenda of the head of department was ensuring that he had electricity and no one else did. So that was absolutely key technology for, to, for enabling research. But sometime during the next 15 or 20 years, finally, there was a sharing of that service. There was probably an Oxford University electrical service, uh, OUES, was set up to make this more, more widely available. It eventually found its way into some of the colleges, uh, despite furious protests from a load of dons about how it would undermine the whole fabric of the, the university and things like that. But it, you know, it even made its way into the colleges. And then right, round about the 1950s, maybe something like that, the Oxford University Electrical Service, somebody says, well, why, why do we actually need an electrical service? And they dug in, yes, we need an electrical service. We provide an important service to the university. Well, actually, they eventually did get disbanded and um, now pe people get electricity in, in, in laboratories that by, by arrangement with, 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 with the national grid, the utility. <coughs> so that was a key research technology. And over a period of, I don't know, uh, 50 years, um, it, it lost its importance as a key research technology and the whole thing moved on. Of course, there was new things, new research enabling technologies that were uh, at the top of the professor's agenda. So again, if we fast forward now to the 1980s, <coughs> the first departments that were able to send international email had a tremendous advantage um, in the way they were able to conduct research, particularly international research. And it was quite difficult actually sending an email internationally back in those days. CBS percent, you had to put the whole routing of the, uh, the email into the address. But once you, you got somebody's address in, in the right format, you could keep sending it. So individual departments had their own email systems. And if they were set up well, that was a key um, research technology. Then sometime during the 1990s, that got the internet came along and internet email addresses, it all became a lot easier. And sometime in, in the early 2000s, you started to have the free offerings and the cloud offerings. But you still had the people 
in saying we, pro we must provide the email service for our department. This is a key academic tool, but actually the head of department, his attention had moved on. Back in the 80s, he thought it was important. By the 2000s, he didn't. Um, but there was still, a, a, these services still persisted for quite a long time. But again, I think those are, they're finally going now. And we're seeing people using these cloud-based um, email services. So despite some quite furious resistance by staff in uh, local IT services and local departmental IT services, some of whom I've managed, <coughs> So I've seen this uh, at close hand. So technology keeps, keeps moving along. <coughs> and I think what it's important, therefore, is if we're working in technology, we do need to keep innovating. We can't stand still, or we'll be like the Oxford University Electrical Service or the departmental email providers. We'll render ourselves obsolete. I don't know how, for how long, but 10 years, 20 years. Unless we keep innovating, um, we won't stay at the forefront of what we're trying to do. <coughs> so this is my uh, model, which says that today's innovation, this is what we're working on now, this is the robot turns around. In 20 years' time, it will become a commodity, it will become a utility. Electricity on demand, hugely innovative 100 years ago. The conveyor belt turned, now it's been a commodity for some time. Email on demand. Very few departments now still run their own emails. They still want to, which is incredible, really, when you think about it. But, you know, their, their, their days are very much numbered as the conveyor belt turns around. And actually, for people who enjoy innovation, it's important that the conveyor belt turns around because now that frees up the resource, frees up the capacity to do the next lot of innovation, which is going to be necessary to enable the next generation of academic research and the next generation of technology enabled learning. <laughs> so, I don't know how you measure the pace of innovation, but uh, I suspect if you, if you could, you'd find that that, that pace was increasing. So it's like the, the Red Queen and Alice, we're now having to run faster and faster and faster and innovate more and more rapidly, just to keep still, just to stay on this in the So that's why technology organisations need to innovate. If they don't, they'll become the next Oxford University electricity service. Now, I. I made that point quite a lot going around and visiting other universities' IT services. For example, um, a couple of universities who wanted to try and persuade their own staff that they really didn't need to keep running their own email system in-house actually invited the director invited me to come and give you a talk and try and you know tell them what will happen if they politely if they if they don't try and hand this all over and, and, and move on <coughs> to the next thing. I'm having a slightly a similar but different conversation in, in JISC now because in the same way that electricity is becoming a utility, if you think of the range of JISC services, the, the bottom of the stack is the Janet Network, which is still incredibly valuable service, particularly some of the faster research connections. I'm sure it will be for the next few years. But bandwidth is also becoming a utility in the same way that electricity did. And I can't imagine that in, <coughs> in 10 years' time, maybe sooner, um, people will be worrying about having a special university provider of bandwidth, just like they don't worry about having a special university provider of electricity. So within just we're having a conversation, okay, the Janet Network it is a, it's a fantastic asset now, and let's make the most of that asset for the next few years. But let's not predicate our whole future on that need being there, because it won't, it will go away. Bandwidth, you know, there's, even to my house in Redruth in Cornwall now, there's a, there's a fibre optic cable. I mean, that's pretty incredible. You, you, even five years ago, you wouldn't have imagined that. OK, it's taken a huge subsidy from, and a lot of money to, to, to oil the wheels within BT and things like that to, to get it to happen. <coughs> so we need to be thinking all the time, what are these areas that are going to be tomorrow's commodities? Let's start shaping up for that, getting ready to offload them and creating the space to do the next round of innovation, which is going to keep our own organisations uh, at the forefront and, uh, and nationally for GIST to help keep the UK at the forefront of learning and research, which is part of GIST's future. So, for GIST in particular, what direction is it going to have to move in over the next few years? And it must be, you know, if this has this physical level, okay, there'll be some specialist needs for research, which I imagine will continue, but it's sort of generic networking bandwidth service. As that becomes a utility, the only way we can move is up this stack. And that's where organisations like CETIS come in. Because um, if you speak to 
Martin Harrow, um, and I, I agree with his, his analysis, but he's got a, a strong view that at the moment, JISC has great strengths in that networking area and the related, the, the lower levels of the, the OSI stack. And really there's a bit of a gap in the middle. And then it's very strong up at the content area, up at the resources area again. And one of the things I've been asked to do is to try and fill that gap. It's not a massive gap. We, we, we just need to get a few people in. Um, you know, we, we don't want to turn the whole organisation into people like this operating in that, in, in that zone. But it is a bit of a gap at the moment, and it's actually a gap that people in this room have the skills to fill. So it's really great that despite all of these changes and changes in funding, this clearly still is a CETIS community that persists, and it's represented by yourselves in the room. And the skills and knowledge that you hold are going to be incredibly important to JISC as it happens, as JISC makes this journey. So I'm very glad that we're still talking to each other, um, and I'm sure there will be plenty of positive conversations to have in the in the future. <coughs> and finally, uh, I was very keen to, okay, we, we saw the surveys about um, the different kinds of technologies. And I think this is the one that really is on the cusp to me, but we need to be realistic about where, where it is at the moment. So um, Martin, I, I don't think we've got them here today, but at, at great expense, you managed to get hold of a pair of Google glasses and it wasn't very easy, was it? I had to use eBay, That's terrible. <laughs> And we've also got colleagues um, down the road, and we've got colleagues in the room today from MIMUS, which is part of the JISC family and will be formally joining the, the JISC organisation on, <coughs> on August the 1st, that work on augmented reality. And I've seen some of their demonstrations, and they're quite good for, for education and for training-based applications. But some of the things I've seen about medical skills, you know, how to operate a particular medical device or carry out a procedure, or mechanical skills, you know, how to find a, replace a component in the car, but the mock-up's always done on a tablet or a phone. And, you know, I tried, I tried it the other week on my car, you know, trying to get my EGR valve out, looking at my phone and using the spanner with one hand. And it doesn't really work with those devices. So the, the wearable devices are actually quite important to make this technology uh, happen. Um, so this will look a bit crude, but this is the reality of where that wearable technology is at the moment. And I'm very grateful to Matt Ramirez of, of Mindmas for putting this together. He's that handsome chap there. This is deliberately a silent movie. And so this is a mock-up he's done using the Google Glasses about augmented reality for, for mending PCs. Okay, so not quite there yet. Um, and I mean, Martin, I don't know if you wanted to say, but the classes are a bit slow. You get very odd looks when you wore them around London. There's still a lot of cultural yeah, stuff. <laughs> maybe in the next couple of years, this technology is actually going to improve with to the point where the augmented reality will work as well as it does on Mac and Mirrors, it's iPads and iPhones. Um, and then I think this, that's the point where this will really start to take off. I um, think the other thing there is actually that's not augmented reality in the sense that it's not like immersive. You've got that little screen hovering above your right arm. And I, I gave those glasses to about 50, 60 people today. And half of them said, I can't see anything. And of course the reason was they wear glasses. It just gives you an idea, you know, you, you can take the, on one level, you can say, right, this is here and now, you can nearly buy these things in shops. Then you realise something as basic as can you make it work for someone who wears glasses? That actually turned out to be a hard problem. So you can see all the science fiction videos on the Microsoft website, and I think the work that Matt's doing and what Martin's talking about is the the reality, but I think these problems are right on the cusp of being solved. So for me, this is the exciting area over the next couple of years. I think this will really start to break through in the way day. In, in the same way that you now, 3D printing two or three years ago was science fiction, and now you, you walk into most departments, certainly at Loughborough University, there are hundreds of the damn things um, chuntering away around the place. Um, 
So I just wanted to, to throw that in. It's a very, very interesting piece of innovation work going on just down the road uh, at Mimas. OK, back to more um, mundane things now and JISC uh, and the changes at JISC. And it's very important. Apologies again for people who've, who've heard this before. Um, but I think it's important to understand what, what the changes are and, and why they've been made. Um, starting with the uh, Wilson Review of JISC, um, which has been out, well, uh, 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 over three years now. And that was a, an official Hefke publication. Obviously, it took into account the views of the Association of Colleges and the FE and the skills community. And there were some positive things about uh, JISC, uh, particularly its, its world-class uh, reputation. And certainly in North America, um, Europe and right around the world, just has got a, has got an excellent reputation, um, which all helps. Well, it's one of, in a small way, it helps the UK with its own strong international reputation when it comes to higher education, recruiting international students, all of those kind of things. So it's important that we, we keep that going. Um, also, JISC is unique in providing a holistic approach. And that means, as I understand it, starting with the Janet network from the electrons and the photons going through the network, working its way up through the stack, possibly with that slight dip in the middle of the stack, that, that, that sort of technology gap which I mentioned, but certainly finishing strongly towards the top of the stack in the content area, um, the resources area, and also the policy and the people areas. So there's some positive things that made people think that JISC was worth retaining as an organisation. But there were some specific um, suggestions around the innovation work that JISC had been doing. Um, namely that the portfolio, the innovation portfolio was too large. The philosophy was let a thousand flowers bloom and deliver a final report and then probably not track those flowers anymore. Most of them died. A few of them did co carry on to grow quite strongly, but some of those we never really kept in touch with, even though we'd helped to, to grow them. Um, and the suggestion was to move away from that to focusing on a smaller number of big trees, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, JISC as a funder, JISC used to give out lots of money through JISC calls. Um, the Wilson Group said that the application process of that was opaque. Remember, this is a civil service report written in civil service language. Opaque is actually a very strong word in that lexicon. Um, and whilst the process was one of open calls and bidding, I think the people who wrote the report did an analysis of where the money was going, and it was ending up in a very small number of places, and they used those, th th those are those words, and I think they speak for themselves. Um, projects aren't translated into life services or take too long to develop. To be fair, those weren't the rules of the game. You know, it was to, to spend the money to sort of stimulate some thinking, but then not, not actually worry too much. So, it, it, with hindsight, at the top level, maybe that wasn't the best thing to have done. For the people working uh, in the innovations team, that was what they were asked to do. And just to see, not to see it itself as a research organisation, the people who were, wrote the Wilson Review and now the, the funding councils, <laughs> they have set up, and, and biz, they set up research councils to give money out for people to do research, to bid for academic research, the sort of academic research that might end up in the REF, which is the benchmark of the sort of quality of research that the, the state, the government wants to fund. And the people who wrote the Wilson Review thought it was absolutely wrong that JISC was giving out money as a kind of quasi-research council. And often for research, it might have had value as practitioner research, but not research that was ever going to end up being in a university's REF submission or an individual uh, REF submission. And so essentially we were told not to do that anymore. <coughs> um, we've now completely moved away from the traditional JISC call for funding uh, and, and funding those kind of... Uh, research projects. We still have money to invest and we're going to do it in a different way which I'll, I'll come back to but the traditional GIST call is, has, is no, no longer exists as mandated by the Wilson report. So um, we're working very hard to try and implement the changes in the Wilson review. Right or wrong those decisions were made by the people who hold the purse strings three years ago. That debate took place, finished, 
and, and now we're trying our best to implement it. <coughs> Whether you agree with it or not, please be assured that we're doing our best to implement that. It's not easy, and even if you do agree with it, to change a large, diverse organisation, to change its direction, to change some of its culture. Um, but we are trying very hard to implement what's in the Wilson Review and to make sure that JISC continues to do new innovative things that will help keep the UK higher education effort and skills right at the forefront on the world stage, which of course is where it is at the moment um, and, uh, and obviously in the areas of digital technology. And we will need your help to do that, which is what I'm going to come to shortly. So JISC used to just be a committee had no staff, um, but it had a very complicated series of funding contracts. And some of those funding contracts were renewed so many times that they became de facto staff contracts. So they were de facto JISC staff, subject to GP regulations and things like that, although they had formerly held contracts within a number of host universities, particularly Bristol and King's College London, but also Manchester, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Bath, etc., etc., etc. So, very complicated set of arrangements, and uh, Martin Harrow, as chief executive, was asked to change this to stop being a committee and start being an organisation. So now, just as a company, limited by guarantee, which also has charitable status and its charitable purposes around enabling education and research in HEFE and, and skills. And as a company, it has a management structure. And I'll just try and explain how that works. The way I try and do this, Martin will know this one, it's uh, to, to use the analogy of a forest. So again, we were talking about innovation. We're not letting a thousand flowers bloom anymore. We're trying to grow a small number of big trees. So let's say the whole of just is a forest. Chief Executive Forester, Martin Harrow. And then you've got the internal back of house functions from Alice and Mark. So they're making the irrigation work in the forest, making sure the fence is in order around the forest, the car park is sorted out, that's that, that, that kind of thing. Very important, but internal function, not things you necessarily need to be aware of. But then there's three production zones, there's three big clusters in the forest. There's the technology cluster, which includes the Janet Network, which is in Marshall, Leeds. Um, there's the digital resources cluster, um, which Lorraine leads. And then there's the customer experience, and that includes all of the regional support centre, things like Tactis, um, Infonet, those kind of services, which are involved in. So those are the three main production areas of the forest. And what those three foresters are trying to do at the moment is to prune those existing trees and give their bit of the forest a nice coherent shape. Um, via a means of continual service improvement. Um, and they're also trying to do something which they've never done before, which is to actually cut down the odd tree. Because we all know in our own organisations, shutting down a service is a really difficult thing to do. Even if there's one or two people still using it, it's like those old email systems, there'll always be someone who'll come along and say, you, have, you must keep this going. It's essential for me to do my, my work. But hopefully, as well as keeping their existing trees in shape, they might find one or two things to cut down. Because we really need to focus on doing a smaller number of things well. So they're beavering away, trying to keep their bit of the forest um, <coughs> intact. Then over here is Chief Innovation Officer. I'm running the nursery. What I'm trying to do is to grow the new trees. Um, and those trees, some of them will start off quite well, but they'll start to fizzle out a bit. And what I need to do when that happens is very quickly say, OK, fair enough, we're going to learn some lessons from that, but now let's just pick this tree up and get it out of the way into the, the compost. We're not going to take it any further. But some of these trees are going to grow and they're going to keep growing. And they're obviously going to have potential to become new services. And at that point, what I'm trying to do is thinking of transplanting them to be one of the three foresters, depending on what kind of tree it is. If it's a, a new digital resources or research data management tree, it would probably end up here. If it's something to do with training products or, or advice, it would end up here. And if it's something to do with new, for example, new e-learning systems or, or new student information systems, We'll eventually end up here. We're not quite sure where it goes. There's a bit of a gap there at the moment. Anyway, so I'm responsible to, for growing those new trees and trying to transplant them to those other three areas of the, pro the forest. And hopefully, in a way, that fits in with the rest of the trees that are already there. <coughs> and those new trees that I grow 
over a sort of three year cycle, we need to span. This is a circular representation of that wide holistic spread that the Wilson view talked about. So this is our strategic framework. The central is our estimate enabling teaching research and at this particular time efficiency and then spanning the particular technology enabling areas around the site. So, if all of our innovation was just around the open agenda or just around academic leadership, that wouldn't be a very balanced portfolio. So we've got to try and spread the <coughs> investment over a period and try and hit all the parts of that target reasonably evenly within some kind of common sense measure. Um, and so the, my part of the forest is called Digital Futures Division. And um, we've been working hard to fill posts, create a new team. Uh, some of the people come from the old Forages Innovation area, and other people have come from uh, within the sector, um, but, but outside JISC. But they're all friends of JISC, and they've been involved in JISC and its communities over a number of, number of years. So we're not a funder anymore, and I'm, I'm the new chair of the JISC board, who's the vice chancellor just down the road at at Salford University, Martin Hall, he's very clear, JISC needs to be a solution provider, not a funder. So what we're trying to do is find new national scale shared technology services. Um, I think there's some out there waiting to be discovered. We want to find them. We want to build consensus with you. We want to build the services at prototype and then embed them in an appropriate way. And we want to use a co-design type of process to do that to make sure that you as users feel some kind of ownership. And if we do it well, you will actually use the services. <laughs> so we're trying to construct a pipeline of work, a pipeline of small trees uh, in my forest, which will hopefully grow. And first of all, we're going to try and do that in a way that joins up internally. So in the past, I can think we've had people within Janet within the GIST family who are working on uh, AIM, uh, Access and Identity Management. We've had people working on new content services. And the authentication system that the content people have used has been different from the authentication system that the Janet people have been working on. So even within our family, we haven't managed to join up our own thinking. And we just can't afford financially to do that. If we're concentrating on a few big trees, we need to have the internal coherence where the people who are working higher up the cake, higher up the stack, are actually building on uh, the foundations here. So I think that's an important part of my job, which no one seemed to have that responsibility before. So trying to join up all of our technologies in a coherent way is certainly something we'll be focusing on in, in future. I think it can only benefit our users and our communities. Um, <coughs> we have got money to invest. We've got, well, several million pounds per annum. Um, and actually using the co-design process, the one benefit of the old JISC funding model, the old JISC call, you could pretty well guarantee spending your budget at a particular time because you offer people, you bid, people bid against money and you give it out. Um, at the moment, we're actually spending money more slowly than our finance director would like. Not by much, it's about right. So we certainly still have money to invest. What we've been told is try and invest money more at the low risk end of the spectrum. So a low risk project, innovation project, is one that's most likely to be something that's practical, useful, will turn into a production service. You'll notice this graph doesn't taper down to zero. We're still allowed a small number of very high-risk speculative projects. And uh, so Martin, with his job title as futurist, he still has a, some chance to get some money for some sort of uh, learning science fiction or, or, or something like that at, at that end of the scale. But in that kind of proportion. <laughs> and also, during this first few months that I'm in post, I've been very keen to go and meet and speak to as many people as possible, which is a, a doubly grateful to have the invitation today um, to try and explain the changes at JISC and then to get your feedback to help shape what we're going to do. Because we've set some of the top level parameters, um, but the detail is, is to emerge. So putting all that together, <coughs> we've got a sort of, somehow or other, we've got to construct something that's a convolution of our strategic impact area, so we've got to hit all the zones on the target. We've got to complete with this risk distribution, so we've got you know, mainly low risk 
happens is it works at some higher risk. Most importantly, it's got to be in line with the sector's priorities, trying to solve the problems, the teaching problems and the research problems that our communities are saying are most pressing. We've got to distill that down into a pipeline which has this internal coherence. So we're building on higher up the stack on some of the technologies we have in place, lower in the stack, and we're joining up that conversation. We're taking that through a co-design uh, development cycle, working very closely with potential users of the service so they feel they've got ownership. Sometimes those innovations will fail, the trees will go onto the compost, in which case we can still learn lessons. There's always valuable uh, lessons one can learn. It's the worst thing that happens with a failed technology project is when, we see this happen all the time in the public sector, is when it just quietly gets swept under the carpet because those lessons don't get learned properly. Um, we're not going to do that. We, innovations are allowed to fail. Um, we'll admit it and we'll try and learn more lessons. But as, in as many cases as possible, we're keen that the innovation we're going to do will lead to new trees that get transplanted across into the other parts of the forest and actually they end up in the JISC product catalogue. Hands up who knew JISC had a product catalogue. That's pretty good actually, you're an informed audience and that's still, but that's still about 20% of, of the room. No. Just to go off a slight tangent, did anybody see the, a couple of weeks ago, the Higher Education Policy Institute and the National Union of Students announced the results of their big student survey? Anyone see those? Okay. Now I thought what was that what was interesting there is if you looked at some of the fundamentals, the total amount of money going into funding teaching and learning in the sector over the last year, from from, from last year to this year, hadn't changed very much. Not the grand total. It had actually gone up a little bit despite all the cuts. But it's about the same. The number of contact hours in courses was about the same. The number of students was about the same. There was one measure in that survey which had really changed. In all the fundamentals were the same. The one thing that really changed was the student's perception of value for money. And in that one year period, that had gone from about 90% thinking they were getting value for money, whatever that means, to about 50%. So all the fundamentals were the same in terms of the grand total budget. But of course, the one thing that had changed is that those £9,000 fees, that 9,000, 6,000 of that 9,000 used to go straight from the Tooth Fairy, straight from the funding council into the universities. Now it comes via the student loan company in the way that the student believes it's their own money. It is the student's own money. And they certainly think that way. And that one change, although the, shape, the, the teaching they're getting, the experience, the funding, everything else has stayed the same, that change in terms of the transparency of the funding has had a huge impact in the way the students perceive the value for money of what they're getting. And something similar has, unless you've got an alternative explanation. But I think that's, what, that's, that, that's certainly this, their perception of value has changed by that much and, and none of the other parameters have changed at all. Um, something similar is going on with JISC. In the past, all of JISC's funding used to come from, in higher education, used to come from the funding councils, from the Tooth Fairy. And actually people, people didn't seem to be worried then. Was, was, JISC, was JISC spending that money well? Well, people used to bid for the grants, they used to bank the cheques. I don't think they used to worry too much about whether the, the, the right things were being invested in until the Wilson Review, and that said what it said. <coughs> um, but now, as a, and as a result of the Wilson Review, 20% of JISC's funding, instead of coming straight from the funding councils, it goes through the university. So it's completely analogous to the fees, the, the, the nine grand fees going through the student loans and through the students, inside to the students, so they feel it's their money. Just 20% of JISC's funding is now coming not straight from the funding council to JISC but by, via the universities. So they, they've, they're exposed to that 20% and they feel it's their own money. Has that had an impact on their perception of JISC? Has it ever? So that people are now, and I, th I think in it, primarily it's, it's a very positive thing. People are now very focused on, okay, we know this is just 20% of the picture, but now we're really interested to know what are we getting for our money? Is JISC spending our money wisely? I think this is precisely what people who wrote the Wilson report hoped. Now, I must admit, one or two universities have gone a bit, have been a bit overzealous in the way they perceive this. But once you know, the, the norm has been a healthy um, inquiry into how just spends its money, which was wholly lacking in the previous years when hundreds of millions of pounds were of, of your money, you know, of the sector's money was spent. So people are saying, what do I get for my subscription? I pay a subscription. I want to know what my entitlement is. So 
we're putting together for the first time a product catalogue which will list in one place all the different GIST services. But what we need to add to that, and that, so this is work in progress, what will appear over the next six months is what value does one get from that? First of all, for the sector as a whole, um, you're paying X, but you're getting Y, where Y is three or four times X. It's hopefully where we can end up. So it's a, it's a no-brainer that you're getting value from your subscription. And eventually, for individual institutions to be able to drill down and see, that based on some simple metrics of usage, what their own uh, value is that they're getting from their GIST subscription, and also a simple predictive model that shows some of the extra services they could easily use to increase that value. So a complete focus for us over the next three years is to try and refine this product catalogue, not just to list all the products and services, but also the value that they're providing the individual universities and colleges. Um, a lot of effort's going to be going in that direction. Why three years, I hear you ask? Anyone know the answer to that, apart from Martin? Because in three years, that's when the next review is going to... Actually, we don't know whether the money's gone or not. But in three years, there'll be a... So at the moment, people have to pay the subscription, but it's a non-voluntary subscription. <laughs> <laughs> so it's universal. So you can see it going through your bank account, but it's like a direct debit, and you can't control it. Now, in three years' time, all of those rules will be renegotiated, and everybody expects the non-voluntary to disappear. Uh, I, it's, it's almost certain. And, and whether it remains an 80-20 split, we, we, don't, we don't know, but we're all pretty certain that the non-voluntary clause will disappear. So we've actually got three years to prove our value in this way, which isn't very long, um, and that's what we're trying to focus on. So we really want to do useful things that you will value and you will see the benefit of within that time period. And the way we want to try and do our innovation, therefore, to fit in with that, is via co-design, which is a more agile, uh, partnership-based focus um, process, which involves working with representatives of stakeholder groups at an early stage um, to pilot, develop, and then deliver and hand over new products and services. We did a pilot. Well, I didn't because it was before I started at JISC. Um, and the pilot started last, almost a year ago, last August. Um, and the pilot involved getting these five organisations Research Libraries UK, Russell Group, IT Directors, Scholars, the Club of Librarians, and the size of the Club of University IT Directors, and JIS, getting them to nominate people, give them a budget, lock themselves in a room, and come up with some list of problems that they wanted to try and solve in their own institutions, and then to propose projects to try and address those. This is what they came up with. Um, I think that the important point to note for me is rather than the list, which there's some some things have been, most of those have moved forward quite well, some have been more successful than those, particularly the National Student Innovation Competition. But JISC is now here as an equal partner in the process with the other uh, stakeholders. Now in the past we used to dole out money, but then we just used to perform a quality assurance role and invite people to give a presentation at a dissemination event. But we'd step back during the, the execution of that work. Now, we're not there to dominate the conversation, but we're there as an equal partner in this innovation process alongside the representatives of the other groups. And that's very different from how we've worked in the past. Um, I think, that, again, the, the area that people were most <coughs> pleased with um, coming out of that pilot uh, was the Student Summer of Innovation, where we won a national competition. And we've repeated it again this year. We've asked the students to come up with their own ideas of things that will improve their experience. And with things like gamification, it's actually quite difficult for universities to do this themselves. It's kind of ethical. If, if Loughborough University decided to put on its VLE uh, sort of leaderboards of courseware and, and opt students into it without them saying, they'd be, they'd be out, an outcry. There'd be all sorts of ethical considerations. But if the students set something up like that up themselves um, and make it's up to students whether they opt in or not. That can actually be quite good. It sidesteps any of those ethical concerns. Uh, you know, the university in question can keep an eye and make sure that it's, 
it's not it's game it's not sort of gamifying inappropriate activities, but you know, relevant academic and social activities. And that can work quite better. So there were some projects around a voluntary gamification, but actually the, 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 the big success so far has been in, in, in the research area, which is at the moment these companies that charge large amounts of money to academic researchers to find cohorts, which tend to be university students actually, most sort of mules and guinea pigs tend to be students themselves. Um, and this is a sort of crowdsourcing social tool for doing it. So as a student or a, a, a volunteer, you can, you can register with the system and say the sort of research you'd like to help with. And as an academic, you can go in and register and say what sort of cohort you're looking for. And the system will, will do the rest. So we're piloting that at the moment. It's gone through. We've, we've given two, two additional chances of funding. Um, and we're hoping to see that continue to, uh, to grow, um, not just in the UK but around the world. And those students are still very keen to keep working with JISC, I'm, I'm pleased to say. We haven't put a contractual straitjacket around them. They, were, they are able to, to, to walk away if they want, um, but they don't. Uh, they're, they're actually postgraduates from, from Nottingham University. So there's a successful pilot of co-design, but we were still running the traditional JISC calls in, in parallel with that. We had a decision to make in November. Do we keep that parallel track? Or do we just say, the Wilson report absolutely slated the traditional just call. We know we want to phase it out quickly. Shall we just do it now? We made the choice, yes, let's just do it now, which meant very quickly scaling up the co-design process. So the co-design process became the sole process uh, for, for innovation. First, that involved trying to retrofit the existing portfolio of projects into co-design. Hard. Um, and then launching a new uh, co-design year. And we had various discussions. Rather than just having one budget and one blank piece of paper, what, through talking with various stakeholders and also the, the GIST board and funders, they said, well, split it up into four. You can have four different themes, big strategic challenges that the, 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 there's consensus in the sector that the sector wants to try and address. And then structure some projects under those using the co-design methodology. So there'll be four blank pieces of paper. So they're not quite blank, they've just got a heading on the top now, which is the theme type. And there's notional budgets. And then groups of, of relevant stakeholders, which CETIS, we'll see in a minute, CETIS could easily be a, the CETIS community rather than the, the, the department, could, could be a, a, a stakeholder group in, in quite a meaningful way in a couple of these as, as we go through them. Um, and then those groups together have ownership. Just provides the money. Just is an equal partner around the table, not a dominant partner. Um, and these groups decide what particular areas they want to address. For some of these themes, that's going to be easier than others. We went through a, quite a rigorous process of intelligence gathering and um, workshops and post-it notes and brainstorming. The full just shooting match of, of tools for. Uh, reaching some kind of shared view. And I think the outcome was, was there's people in the room that were involved in that, a small number, I think. I was quite surprised. Some of the, it's a couple of the things I wasn't very surprised at, and a couple of the things I was. So let's have a look what came out of this exercise. Remember, so these were groups such as Sconor, Rugget, um, USISA, Association of Colleges, uh, Association of Learning Technology, National Union of Students, um, Buff Doug, and we had two pro vice chancellors in the room as well. So we had a good spread of stakeholder groups, uh, senior managers from universities. Um, the first thing they came up with, um, hope you, if you can't read all of this, hopefully the slides will be um, going around. It, it, the detail isn't really important. This, was, this wasn't such a surprise for me. <laughs> it's around research at risk. The, the fact that the current approaches to research data management within individual institutions tend to be just about in, ensuring short-term compliance with the current research council policies in order to, to avoid the risk of funding being stopped because although it hasn't happened there's a threat that if policies aren't complied with then research council funding may be with, with health. Um, people felt, and this isn't necessarily a just view, this was the view of the quite a knowledgeable group of people that were in, in the room, um, that these piecemeal approaches probably didn't, weren't the most efficient and effective way for the sector as a whole to achieve the aims of open research uh, that the policies, the research council policies were, were, were primarily about. 
And there might be a better way if, if efforts were, were coordinated more nationally and just could have a role to play in that. So all that's been decided so far is this is a theme that, that needs to be addressed. We can predict all sorts of things that might come out of that, but that would be to preempt the process. So I'm not going to go into, in, into too much detail, but that's a clear problem that uh, people want to try and solve. Obviously, standards have a bit, not, not so much educational standards, but research standards in this case are potentially an important part of that, uh, addressing that challenge. And then this was another one that I wasn't surprised at so much. People have been talking a lot about uh, learner analytics and individual institutions, some institutions have done a great deal of work. I think Bolton has done a lot of work in this area, for example, is that correct? Um, so this, but there's a lot of universities and a lot of colleges who haven't done as much. So I think people are saying just can help disseminate that good practice, but then also look at a national level uh, service, maybe around benchmarking, see to be anonymised, you don't want to, your competitors won't want to disclose exactly where they are, but some kind of clustering of, of different types of universities. Uh, and also taking a national view on predictive models for identifying um, uh, uh, students at risk. It's quite interesting that I, I was invited to the uh, Russell Group Pro Vice Chances for Learning and Teaching, and I put one of my s slides, which I haven't got today, but it was about um, the competitive market and just can't give money to the individual universities. It's got to try and spread money across the piece now. Uh, and because these, we don't want to skew the market, we don't want to skew competition. So we ask, I asked those progress chances. So for example, just say one of you had a really good predictive model for that spotted your students that are about to drop out. You wouldn't want to, that, that would really help you retain your students. You'd want to keep hold of that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't want to share that with everyone else. And they all thought, and I was quite surprised, they came back very quickly and said, actually, yeah, you're right, there's some things we wouldn't cooperate on anymore because of the market, but not that. We still would share our predictive model for analytics. I thought, oh, okay, okay, fine. So, that, therefore, that is something which, which people, even in the new competitive world, people are still happy to, to share and collaborate on that kind of thing, which I think is good news. It means that just can therefore get involved and try and do that. So, hopefully, those are the sorts of things that could come out at a national scale from this kind of work. And now we're going on to this. This is the one that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> Not because I didn't understand the challenge. I just think it's potentially very big and very ambitious. OK, so I don't, have we got any representatives from tribal or SITs or anything in the room? Ah, OK, so this is quite interesting because I think what people are saying is that they see, and again, don't blame the messenger, <laughs> but they see student information systems which are designed on first of all on the mainframe paradigm so there's no element of multi-tenancy or of ability to sh share results um, and also they're very much di driven by the administrator as king or queen um, so they're administrative systems there has been some self-service functionality added and uh, it doesn't get always the best feedback well you know what the feedback self-service functionality gets um, the student isn't at the centre of the system, both in terms of the data model and in terms of the, the tools that are provided. And so people are starting to think, well, you know, we're talking about putting the students at the centre all the time. Perhaps we should do it with our student information systems. Um, and is there some next big thing, some next generation of systems that actually does this? There are starting to be some candidate things happening inevitably in North America, um, and I'm sure there are in other parts of the world as well. Um, so is there a new generation of systems that will better support the student journey? Um, and if so, if just can spot that and can help bring it over, and, you know, this could be an opportunity if, if, if the supplier was itself was struggling with a platform that the supplier itself thinks has gone beyond its paradigm, and I was hoping that something else would come on and it could migrate its users onto that because it's finding it more and more difficult to keep that paradigm aligned to the expectations of its customers. And there could also be role for a supplier as well. Whereas if a supplier just wanted to keep flogging their system for as long as possible, knowing that it, eventually the wheels are going to come off, I'm not sure. But, but I think there are, there are possibilities for very much for cooperative work um, for people who are interested in these new generations of systems that have certainly North American universities are working quite harder. Um, so joining a CRM with a sort of traditional student records functionality with the alumnus system, 
and also at a national level. And this is where it gets a bit difficult. I really don't know how this is going to pan out. But another thing that came out quite clearly from that National Union of Students HEPI survey um, was that students themselves now are wanting to bring back cats. They want to be able to maybe do a couple of years doing HE courses at their local FE college and then maybe spend a year in a London university and then get a degree at the end, <coughs> end of it. And why not? You know, it's, if it's difficult to afford, why shouldn't this system be run for their benefit? Whereas individual universities are putting a huge amount of effort into recruiting and then retaining students for the whole period of the course. So there's a bit of a tension there between what the customer wants and what the supplier wants. Certainly in terms of the universities, maybe the colleges as HE providers will have a, a, a different perspective on that. And can this system, you know, we've got... We've talked about unique learner numbers and higher education achievement records. Is it possible to have some sort of widening of that which, which would help this happen? There'll certainly be demand from the National Union of Students. And I know if the NUS is really taking part in putting people onto the co-design group, you know, I know that's the direction that they're going to be pushing in. And it'll be different from possibly what, a couple, what, what the universities themselves might want. So that's very ambitious. I don't know where that's going to lead, um, to be honest. It's not something that just really done before. Um, and hugely relevant to people in the room. If you want to participate, I think there's every opportunity. And then, again, I, wasn't I didn't expect this one to come out, but I was quite glad that it did. It's, it's axiomatic that the best way to get your best return on any system is to invest in the people and processes and, and skills. And there's a particular issue coming out of all of these student surveys that the way lecturers use technology doesn't match the aspirations of the kids you know, coming in to, to HE. There's loads of over they're disappointed, etc. So how can we help with that? The new digital pedagogy and the leadership experience that that's um, uh, also needed at senior levels in, in, in universities and colleges. Um, so again, not something that just done a huge amount of in the past, although it has been involved in changing the learning landscapes and stuff like that. But uh, particularly with changes around higher education academy and uh, things like that, there may be an opportunity here for just to do something um, quite useful, working closely with other groups, with Leadership Foundation, Higher Education Academy and other relevant stakeholders. So those are the four challenges that stakeholders came up with. <coughs> And you're very welcome to get involved. So finally, I'm going to spend five minutes trying to be a little bit provocative around standards and innovation. First of all, let's start off with an example from outside the sector. So hopefully this is safe. Um, the title, the perfect is the enemy of the good. I hope this might give you a clue where, what my take on standards is going to be. Um, NHS Connecting for Health. Budget, 11 billion? Uptake? Well, you can, you can answer that. But it created a data spike, which is, as far as I can, as far as, again, it just, some of the information has disappeared, which is, in terms of lessons learned, it's, it, I think you know, there are opportunities to learn lessons, and they're either taken or they aren't. Um, but there was a very detailed data spike. I think so detailed, it was probably quite bloody difficult to implement. Um, anyway, <coughs> what happens next? Anyone? Minister cancels whole project and writes off 11 billion. OK, so this is an example of a project with a very micro-defined uh, set of standards and the outcome that it had. Coincidence or causality? I don't know, but, but true. Uh, and not in this sector. Let's look at something else, something which didn't have an example of learning which on the face of it doesn't appear to have any standards at all. So a lot of people in the room have seen about Sigal Dimitri and his hole in the wall self-organised learning. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does anyone not have a clue what, what I'm talking about? So this is the computer put in a particular environment uh, with kids in, in, in an Indian village uh, who were able to undertake quite sophisticated learning tasks. Obviously, the system didn't incorporate IMS, any of those sorts of standards. But it did have some standards. And actually, what, first, if you take a casual look at this work, what it appears to say is you don't need, you know, we don't need teachers, we don't need any of this stuff at all. But actually, what he's found is that this, this kind of learning only works in a very particular 
context in a particular environment, and you have to create the environment. And if you create the right environment, then that system of learners will self-organise itself. And this is well understood to people who study um, complexity uh, in, in mathematics and self-organised criticality. If you see the system, in a complex system in a particular way, then it can organise itself and create meaningful structure. But if you get that initial seeding wrong, then it won't. <coughs> and actually, the way, by luck or by judgment, the way you first set up this hole in the wall it was a very important... That precise configuration and getting those kids to interact in a particular way was a very important seeding, which allowed the learning to emerge. As an, that was the emerging property. And for me, that was the standard. You may not have realised it at the time, but as, if you set up the, the, the learning system in that standard way, um, you, you can get this self-organised learning effect, which is very powerful. So, actually, if, if, you, if you understand what he's saying, they were standards to his model of education, and it's the way you set up that hole in the wall in an environment in a village with kids who are interacting in a particularly boisterous manner. If you don't have any of those ingredients, it doesn't work. So you could regard that as a set of standards, albeit a fairly loose set of standards. But that's obviously a very powerful method of learning. I don't think anyone can deny the learning outcomes that, that, that were achieved there. Um, Wikimedia. Now, my, wife, my wife's now a junior doctor in, in Trillis Hospital in Truro. And during her medical degree, she got a session from somebody in the library said, don't look up uh, Wikipedia when you're doing your coursework. And she said, well, I, I, you know, I shut up, but you know, what a stupid thing to say. Everybody looks at Wikipedia. And sure enough, you know, she spent the rest of her degree, every time she's been on the wards with doctors, the first thing they do when they don't know is to go on to Wikipedia. The only person who told her not to use it was a librarian. I don't know what, but it's, it happens to be a fact. It um, started off as a very simple, open system. Um, no real set of standards at first, just a simple web-based system for putting up material and editing. But relatively quickly, a culture emerges. Like there's a culture in a, in a community, um, like the CITES community. And actually, it's that that creates the formal standards of just the way that web system works. But the culture that emerges, it's a self-organising system, is actually very strong and makes this a resource that if you ask doctors in the UK, do they use Wikipedia, I'm sure very large majority will say yes. So I don't know what the librarian's problem was. Can someone explain it to me? Can someone tell me this doesn't have strong, a strong set of rules now? No, I didn't understand that either, but it's, it's, it's true. So I think this is a really good example of something that starts off with a very, an empty system, with a simple uh, set of technical tools for editing content, where very quickly a culture emerges and, and a very powerful um, tool arrive. So again, there are standards there, but they're relatively light touch, and the rest of it is left to emerge. And now we are getting close to home. <laughs> and we know about LTI as a rigorous standard that addresses a clear need. And then we also know about, a couple of years ago, basic LTI. And I was told last night Charles Severin was involved, and it was quite contentious. Quote. Um, and his involvement was to make it pragmatic, like the touch. Um, and as a result, I think some, there's been a lot of innovation around it. For example, the, the Canvas VLE um, and the, the App Centre. Full of innovative things that people can plug into the, the Canvas VLE. So I think that intervention has had a really marked effect in improving the innovation, the capacity for innovation, uh, and, and leaving that space. In, in, the, in those LTI standards. Well, maybe there's another explanation. I'm and I'll be interested to hear what, what people think of that. There's certainly been a change in the last couple of years, and in a way that seems to have stimulated innovation. And finally, penultimately, have we got all standards addressing sort of a problem? We heard about standards for coursework submission at the moment. We've got an absolutely critical problem with. Uh, a company that's just been taken over for $700 million can probably avoid, uh, afford expensive lawyers. So I won't name them, but we all, know <laughs> about them. we all know that a leading UK provider in plagiarism and coursework submission um, is, is attracting comments about how well its systems are, 
uh, performing under load at the moment. Um, and we all know that, I mean, most of us know that other solutions are available. Martin, you've just come back from the UNIS conference and you know, there's a number of systems in Urkund, for example, you can... some of the existing standards and actually solutions to the problem, the company who I deal on there, we're talking about making sure that all of their products are L and uh, interfaces are LTI compatible. So if anybody's interested in running a pilot to, to create an abstraction layer, and so it's very easy to migrate from product A to product B, um, whether you actually end up doing it or not, it's another thing, just, the th just that we're taking it seriously might, might make this company uh, give a product problem a bit more attention. Um, if anybody's interested in, in doing some work around it, I think just, we've just been asked what can we do to solve the problem. Yes, we can go to yet another meeting with the supplier will promise us X, Y, and Z and deliver what we deliver. Or we can actually make it possible for people easily to move away from that supplier to another. Believe me, money talks, that's the, that's the one thing just can do that, that, that could really help. Based on standards, but based on a pragmatic use of them. Um, so, my final concluding point is we said right at the start that Technology, so technology organisations need to innovate, okay? Um, and we also need standards. But if the standards get in the way of the innovation, then that's a clash. So a technology organisation must use standards that continue to allow innovation, because technology organisations must be able to innovate. So my hypothesis is completely unproven, um, maybe some truth in it, maybe nonsense. The best standards, particularly that help innovation, are around seeding complex systems. They only define the things that need to be defined and they let the rest of the system organise itself. Particularly they light a touch and they leave space, they leave room for innovation in a way that the micro-defined standards, the canonical type of fine-grained standards simply don't leave any room for manoeuvre at all. They don't leave any space for innovation. <coughs> so the best standards from an innovation point of view are light to touch they appeal to the self-organising nature of the systems and the, the cultures that we work in, uh, and they leave space for innovation. They do not become ends in themselves. They are about solving problems. They're about solving learning and teaching problems and research problems. As soon as they start to become ends in themselves, people will quickly lose interest. That's my <laughs> hypothesis. Innovation is important. These are the sort of standards, I think, that help innovation. I think other standards don't. I'm really happy to work with people on the sets of standards that, that help innovation and help our technology continue to, to grow and flourish. So, we talked about the need for innovation in a technology organisation. Then we went off on a sidetrack about JISC and its structure, uh, talking about digital futures, my part of JISC and how we're running innovation now, particularly using a co-design process as a replacement to the traditional JISC call for funding how we've scaled that up, and the four challenges that we're running in 2014. Um, research at risk from prospect to alumnus, um, learner analytics, and, and new digital capabilities for leadership pedagogy. And then finally, we've looked at the kind of standards that help seed innovation, rather than stifle innovation. Or, or not, you may not agree. That's it.